right, and welcome everyone tonight to Phoenixville Public Library. For those of you who don't know, you're in the midst of local baseball royalty here tonight with our two guests. Phoenixville's Julian McCracken on the right is former general manager of the Reading Phillies and member of the Reading Baseball Hall of Fame. Also worked for Pro Cards in Pottstown and Fleer Trading Cards in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And on your left, Phoenixville resident Lou Beccaria, the former president and CEO of the Phoenixville Community Health Foundation, who has played high school, college, and semi-pro baseball in Philadelphia, coached youth baseball, and written about baseball. So we know that's why you guys are here tonight, so let's play ball with Julian and Lou. Take it away. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we have a whole variety of kinds of things we can do. So. Uh, I'm going to just start off by uh, with one of my memorabilia pieces here. Uh, this is, you know, you're probably all familiar with uh, Don Larson picking, uh, pitching a perfect game in a World Series. And so this is an autograph, he signed it, and uh, I'll pass it around if anybody would like to see it. It's got the, the stats for the game on it. And uh, he uh, recently, well recently, like within the last year, passed away. But uh, this famous game in October 1956 was uh, never been uh, Never been repeated again. Against my Dodgers. What's that? Against my Dodgers. Against your Dodgers. Yeah. And I gave sure got Dale Mitchell. Isn't that Billy Moore? Yeah. Billy Moore, shortstop. Right. Dale Mitchell. Dale Mitchell. Dale Mitchell. Dale Mitchell. That's right. It was a day game. Uh, another piece of memorabilia for me is uh, autographed by Bobby Shantz, Pottstown. He was the 1952 uh, American League MVP. I believe his record was uh, 24 and 7 that year. And uh, I used to do local cable television here, and I had uh, Bobby Chance on the show about 12 years ago. And I remember him telling a story that uh, after uh, the season was over, he went in to negotiate his contract with uh, Connie Mack. And he only was asking for like $10,000 more. You know, the salaries back then were not that great. So Connie Mack wanted to cut his salary. That's how stingy he was. <laughs> so it was uh, quite a story. There. And he's still alive. Oh yeah, he's 96 years old. And uh, actually I'm going to get a chance to see him again because a friend of mine who's involved with baseball is having his 86th birthday party at a restaurant in Newtown Square on July 15th. And Bobby Chance is going to be here as a friend of, of and, and wouldn't it have been nice had the Phillies offered him the chance to throw out the first pitch during one of the three games against uh, Oakland since it was athletics? Sure. Yeah, right. That would have made a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they don't do everything that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, another piece of memorabilia that I, I have, I'm not as big a collector of memorabilia as Julian is, but this one is uh, <coughs> Denny McLean. As you may remember, he's the last pitcher to ever uh, win. 30 or more games in the season. And he was 31 and 6 in 1968. He had an earned run average of 1.96, and um, he was the most valuable player in the American League in 1968. So, if you remember after that year, they lowered the they, uh, they lowered yeah, amount. Yeah. I'll, I'll pass these around as long as I get them back. <laughs> <laughs> the doors are I, lock, I was going to say, should I lock the door? <laughs> You got security on them, right? I'll lock the door. Did you put chips on them? <laughs> <laughs> Should have those Tigers win the World Series. Yeah. And this one is yeah, yes. a they, they came back from a 3-1 uh, 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 deficit. They're yeah. Mickey, Mickey Lowich. Uh, and the, lastly, this is uh, David Wright. He was uh, all-star first baseman, uh, third baseman, excuse me, for the uh, New York Mets. And uh, I got this of his, so I'll start this one around this side. Did everybody get a chance to see this? Okay. Thank you. Uh, Julian, why don't you take over and, and I'll just... Yeah, I know one of the things we wanted to do is um, ask, uh, ask you to share memories of your, the first Major League Baseball game you can remember going to. Because mine was in Detroit, but I don't remember it. I was three years old. So, uh, but just to get this started, um, Dad was in the Army. And uh, when I was six, we moved to Thailand, so I didn't get back to the States until uh, I was nine. So the first 
ball game I remember going to happened to be what happened in the old days was Memorial Day doubleheaders. Uh, and it was between uh, Baltimore and Minnesota at, uh, at uh, Memorial Stadium. And uh, that was the year that Minnesota went to the World Series. And what was interesting about that game is I had to go back and look it up. Um, there's a thing if you ever want to go back to look up names you may have gone to called RetroSheet.org. Um, you can look up, they have most games within our lifetime uh, scored. So you can look up to see who started and, and, and so forth. And in, uh, in that game, uh, Jim Cott started one, uh, the first game. Um, and the starter for the Orioles was Robert Roberts. So there, you had two future Hall of Famers going against each other. Roberts lasted five innings, and the gentleman that uh, Lou showed a picture of, Don Larson, of all people, pitched the final four innings for the Orioles that day. And then, uh, at that time, a little known pitcher pitched the second game for the Orioles, and that was Jim Palmer. Uh, so another Hall of Famer, and Hall of Famers, future Hall of Famers in that game included uh, Harvey Kellerman, of course. Uh, as well as on the Orioles. Frank Robinson wasn't with the Orioles until the next year, but he had uh, he had Brooks, of course, and, and Jim Palmer. Uh, but that was uh, that was fun to see a Memorial Day doubleheader. And uh, back in the day, they played uh, doubleheaders on Memorial Day, July Fourth, and uh, and Labor Day. And that is uh, it's one of the things I'm going to bring up uh, on if I were a commissioner. So. While we go to Ron Room, if, if you can remember your first uh, major league game, go ahead. Well, actually, you have recollections of two. And, uh, my grandparents on both sides were big Philadelphia A's fans. And uh, I had to look up the date today to make sure. April 24th, 1954, which was our last year. Yeah. I watched and saw the A's beat the Yankees one to nothing. And the interesting thing, because it stuck out in my mind for a kid at, at nine years old, was the pitcher for the A's was Bob Trice. Bob Trice. I don't know if that rings a bell to anybody. He was the first African American player on the Philadelphia A's. Philadelphia A's, okay. And he went off to a 4 0 start that season. And then he got shellacked in a game and he lost his confidence and had a lot of off field issues with abuse that he received. And he has to be sent to the minor leagues. He has to be sent. Wow. He, because he had been a star uh, for the A's affiliate in Ottawa. And he went back to Ottawa where he was successful, never pitched in the major leagues again. And it took three more years for the Phillies this is, yeah. to get a black player, John Kennedy. But the, the game that I most vividly remember is my dad took me to opening night in 1957 when I was about 12 and a half. The Phillies played the Dodgers. I had to look this up. Robin Roberts against Don Newcomb. How do you like oh, that game? Um, <laughs> both guys who could hit. Too. Robin Roberts yeah. pitched great. They gave up four home runs. They were all solo home runs. The Phillies lost eight to seven in 12 innings. And uh, But to see Roberts pitch against Don Newcomb was oh, what a treat for you. Really game. something. How many home runs did you Um, that good? Two, I mean, I, no, at least two. Yeah, I think he hit. I'm guessing. I don't know what I'm talking about. Snyder hit one. I was curious as to whether the starting pitchers hit one. Yeah, because newcomers, the Roberts were really good hit. But the Dodgers had this uh, kind of sidearm relief pitcher, Clem Levine. Oh, yeah. 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 So I got to see all them in that game. That was really good. Anybody else? Uh, well, I, 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 I was probably like seven years old. I saw from Baltimore originally. And Brooks was my hero. I just remember my, I said my dad, but I was really into baseball. My brother and father were really into football and the Colts. I was into the Colts, but I was really into baseball. So uh, I said, Dad, can we go to, you know, go to, finally go to a game? So I had the schedule, and I picked Oakland because I loved their white shoes. I wanted to see Richard Jackson and Joe Rudy and Van. And uh, I remember we were driving down, you know, 33rd Street, and I would just see the lights because it was a night game. And I, um, my heart was just pounding. You know, I got to the box office, you just walk right on up as they were probably averaging 8,000 a yeah. game. And, uh, you know, father got box seats, you know, third base size, always close to Brooks, $6 seats. 
And I just remember walking up the ramp and stopping. Because I watched all the games on TV. Get the TV guide on a Saturday and see what world games are going to be on TV for this coming week. And I was always the camera behind them, played up high. You never really got to see from the outfield and things like that back then. And I remember just walking up, and it just looked so, the pitcher's man on the home plate looked so close. The bases looked close. And I'm like, really? This looks like it's such an easy game. And then I saw how fast the balls were going in. Right. So that was really, I'll, never, I'll just never forget that walking up and just like, just it stopped and just looked around and saw the lush green and just complete awe. Yeah. It was really, it was cool. And it was cool with the Memorial Stadium because you just all of a sudden became out of the neighborhood to all their homes and the stadium was right there. Yeah, right, yeah, it was right there, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's good because that was my my first recollection was mm -hmm. Baltimore too. They just smell the grass and you, you smell the popcorn and the roasted peanuts. And they park your cars I mean, like four deep. So <laughs> sometimes you just had to, especially for cold games, you just had to sit there until there were three people in their big parking lot got there to leave as well. So God forbid you have an emergency. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey yeah. guy, I remember this story. We from South Carolina I was going to race and there's no baseball in South Carolina back in the no, well, until the Braves came out to Atlanta when they left Milwaukee, I think. Yeah, so yeah, over the yeah. Atlanta was no baseball around there. You could go, probably go to see the Georgia Crackers. There was a minor team for Cincinnati Reds. But we could do that because we was on the phone. We had to listen to radios that night. Radios would get you uh -huh. in the mm -hmm. transit, so you got to put your head to it. <laughs> so one night, I was listening to the radio. The Braves was playing the Pirates. So I'm sitting there listening. It was Warren Spoon against Holly Hacks. Oh, wow. Haddock's pitch had a shutout going into the 13th minute. No, I remember that game. Sure. Durant caught, broke it over the home run. <laughs> it was very good. Wasn't that the, uh, <laughs> the, the perfect game. game for 12 minutes? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's the one. Yeah. Uh, we happened to be talking about that game. Well, yesterday. we were talking about that game yesterday. Yeah, I, was, I was listening to it on the radio. We went to the Massachusetts radio. Haddock caught, spot, broke it over the home run. Spawn's game. <laughs> that went yeah. 15 or 16 minutes, and yeah. they pitched. Chuck, when was your first? Well, my first I know was um, was at Shea Stadium. It was after, just right after Seaver got traded. Oh, so it was kind of a lousy time to go. <laughs> I, I remember Doug Flynn and the triple. I remember that. So it was, that must have been 78, I guess. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Probably 78. But the, my, and I, I've been lucky to see two World Series winners, too. Clinchers, the Phillies, and the Mets in 86. Because I grew up in North Jersey. But my best... Favorite game I've ever been to. What I talked about that. I was saying too was 1983. My best friend and I, who were still best friends, he lives in Florida. Sean and I went to the Yankee game on Fourth of July, 1983. We're in 11th grade. We took the subway and train in, you know, because then you could. And uh, we went and we bought two dollar bleacher tickets at Yankee Stadium. Two dollars. Yeah, they were two bucks. I still have the stuff. <laughs> I still have the stuff. Yeah. Two dollar <laughs> tickets. And then, but we're not, we weren't happy with that, so we snuck and we managed to get in the second deck behind home plate. And this is the older stadium, you know, not the old old one, but the middle one. And uh, we each gave the usher ten bucks, and he seated us very nicely down. And when other people came in those seats, he'd go. Psh, Come over and yeah. reseat us. We got reseated about three times. And we had beautiful seats in the second deck, right behind home plate. And that was the day Dave Rigetti threw a no hitter, and Wade Boggs struck out to make the final out. So it was an awesome game. Yeah. Just by luck. So did you have to give the usher ten bucks each time they reseat? No, no, no. <laughs> ten dollars covered the whole game. <laughs> hey, ten dollars in 1983. That's a lot of money. Yeah. How about that? Russell ladies, and your first recollection of your first game? Um, I know, I grew up in Queens, and so, oh. yeah, my family, yeah, we, we used to watch Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, like, it was sure. all on TV. At nighttime, we, I had eight brothers. W, so, w, WPIX? I don't channel, know what channel, channel, I guess it was, channel, channel, was that Channel yeah. 11? Yeah. 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 But, you know, that was a big thing in our family, because I remember the names and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and then the Mets came into being, and, I was in high school and they won the World Series, so that was like we had a day off for that. So that was like really cool. And my Mets, a Mets game was the first game I ever went to with some friends. Okay. Um, and I remember I was way up, so I remember the popcorn and nuts and all that stuff. It's hard to see the field, really. But I, I've gotten to a couple of Yankee games too uh, in the years. Um, yeah. Did, have you 
at the old stadium, or have you been to our new one? Well, I think the old stadium, we saw the Pope when he came. Oh. I think the Pope was there, right? <laughs> yeah, they had Nancy. Was he good there. <laughs> no, and then the newer ones. I, the newer ones was more recent when I saw the games. Yeah. Okay. In the Bronx, yeah. What did I mean? No. No comment. No, no comment. How about the two of you? Oh, mine's embarrassing. I, <laughs> 1984 a Pirates game at Three Rivers Stadium, and uh. I was not a baseball fan at the time. I knew nothing about baseball. I was only there because I was working for a fancy law firm and they took us all to this game, so I was just there for the free drinks and food. And <laughs> I don't remember anything else. It was a night game. Two um, drinks, huh? Yeah. And, <laughs> and then I started dating him. Oh, very <laughs> so you became a baseball fan? I became a Drag baseball cooling. fan. Yeah. I, he, <laughs> took me, he took me to a Saber conference of all things. Oh, I see. They're, they're getting ready to have their next one. And there must have been something in the hot dogs, because I overnight became, you know, wow. and um, that was it. And reader, I married him. <laughs> <laughs> so you like going to running games as much as he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Yeah, really that's, fun. I think a lot of us enjoy running inside the hollow. Yeah. Right. Tony, how about Tony, you? Tony, how about you? You had to go. Uh. Well, I'm going to be, I'm very vague. I mean, it was, I, was, uh, I just remember I started playing Little League Baseball. And I lived down in, uh, in Wayne. And they would, once a, year, uh, a season, they would rent a bus and take kids to a baseball game. I'd never been to a baseball game. And back then, I was a catcher, and I remember Stan LaPata. Um, oh, I got a story about it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you got it. I, so that's all I was looking at. So I got I, 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 all on the way down. All I thought about is I want to see Stan Lepat. I want to, and then Johnny Callison hits a home run. Uh -huh. I don't remember. It was a Connie Mack Stadium, you know, and uh, I'm walking around. And I'm just my yeah. look, looking at. Oh my God, this is Connie Mack. You know, like yeah. I don't remember who they played or what. I just remember I wanted to see Stan. So your hero, Stan Lepat. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Those of you who were, because I've been growing here and being a military kid. When did it? When did the stadium change its name? Was it Connie Mack first, and then Shy Park? No, Shy Shy the other way around. Right. Right. And then Connie passed away, and they renamed. Okay, all right. Now I know the rest of the story. <clears throat> I don't know what year that was, but it was after after it passed. Okay. Uh, it was my my first game was at Connie Mack Stadium, and that was 1956. So I think <clears throat> the stadium had been Connie Mack Stadium for three or four years. <clears throat> so my first baseball game. I was 11 years old and my dad took me to uh, the Phillies playing the Cincinnati Red Legs. Used to be the Red Legs mm -hmm. instead of the Reds. And uh, I remember we were sitting on the first base side in the upper deck on the first row. And uh, I was able to look down and I don't know if anybody remembers the name of Ted Klozuski. Mm -hmm. But Ted Klozuski had like yeah, arms. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, he wore the like short shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 And um, I thought that was like, wow, how can that guy be so big? You know, with his arms and everything. So um, Cincinnati had the sleeveless jerseys. The sleeveless jerseys. Yeah. So uh, that was a that was a nice experience. You know, I remember my dad taking me to that, and I fell in love with baseball from that point on. And, Actually, my dad was very influential on what I did afterwards. So I appreciate that. All right, here's uh, here's one of the topics oh, we time wanted time. to oh, drop. Yeah. yeah. Um, August 26, 1973. I had to look it up today on that sheet um, to make sure of the date. Uh, Don Sutton versus Steve Carlton. Oh wow. Mm. At the vet on a Sunday afternoon, mm. and that was the year that Carlton lost one. The year before he had lost, he had won 27. It's one of the few pitchers to win 20 and then lose 20 the following Whoa. season. My dad, the whole time we're sitting there before the game starts, he's talking about how Carlton's going to pitch a no hitter. And Davey Lopes comes up as the leadoff hitter. He gets a single, and I sit in with a no hitter. <laughs> the Phillies ended up losing seven to three. It was my first major league game. It was the vet. The vet was still fairly new at that point. Only two years old at that point. So they had the big numbers in the back of you. Yes, right yes, yes. But um, but I was with my uncle and my cousins, and uh, you know, you, I, obviously you never you never forget that. Yeah. Somewhere I have some snapshots. So I did take a small camera with me. I knew I took a whole bunch of pictures. I have somewhere buried. 
Yeah, you never forget that. No, you're right. It's all right. Um, if you were, uh, I've got a whole litany of things, but let's see what you, you folks come up with. If you were commissioner for a day, because I've got like 14 things I'd change. If you were commissioner for a day, give us, uh, give us something you would change. Yes. Take away the Lucian Oil game yesterday in the 10th inning, runner on second. The ghost That's game. So do away with the extra rating rule, yeah. which it, it, it's going to be done away with half of this year. Is mm -hmm. it? I had that written down too. That just uh, yeah. it makes it interesting, but it's just not baseball. Well, it's trying to speed up the game and right. not have to go 15 innings or whatever. I understand that, but it's just not it's not genuine baseball. No, and and I question how how the managers manage those those games. They should do away with the mittens too. I was talking about that yesterday too. <laughs> Look, teach so them how to slide feet first. Yeah. That's a lost start. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got, but my pet peeve is, is the walk on music yeah. and even the blasting music in general. Everybody just go back to organs yeah. and remember this blasting music because you can't even think. But the walk on music is especially annoying because these players won't even leave the dugout until their music is played and finished. They yeah. won't even step in the box until yeah. their little tune is finished. And that's what's taking it forever with the game. It's not even when they get to the boxes, they won't go to the box until yeah. they get their little tune. And the other thing is, after every pitch, they step out. Oh. I could probably give, give you eight or ten, but um, <laughs> first, the first things I've written down was um, I, I, I would take a hard look at interleague play. I wrote that down. I think. The, the impact that's had on scheduling has really killed a lot of traditional rivalries between teams. I mean, when I think back to the 60s and 70s, the fact that Phillies don't play the Pirates except one sort of blue moon is hard. I'm just thinking that all those games where uh, Willie Stargell oh. would come to Philadelphia. I mean, they, they paint seats where he hit the ball, you know, <laughs> and all that, and, and that, that's all that's. And, yeah. have, and have it be a pristine World Series where the teams don't play each other yeah. until the World Series. Yeah. I, I tell you, when I first started there, like, and again, I'm a different perspective because I was, grew up in North Jersey. I thought it was pretty cool to watch the Mets and the Yankees play one series, right. but one series, and that's it with your one rival. But then it gets out of hand, and now it's almost half the schedule. Yeah. It was nice, you know. All we had back then was the Mayor's Trophy game. That was like a big deal, yeah. and that wasn't a real game. It was, although George Steinbrenner had. It. Read it, read it, very interesting. You would take it very seriously. Uh, but we, you know, when that first started, that it was like, you know, the Yankees would play the, the you know, the Mets, and, and the, I don't know, there were a few other ones. I guess the Dodgers would play the Angels, and. Phillies would play Boston, well, you know. They, yeah, which is. Or Baltimore. Meh, yeah. yeah. But at least, but one weekend, one weekend, just for fun. Yeah, yeah. But that was it. Now it's out of hand. Now it's every other game. The other thing about scheduling that bugs me is playing a three-game series with a team, and then five days later, you're playing Playing three or four games series with them again. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you don't get a chance to see them later in the season. Whatever. And plus the way they schedule. You know, the last road trip the Phillies went on, they started, I think, in Washington, and then went to Atlanta, and then out to San Diego. It would make more sense to start it out in San Diego and come back east. Yeah. Or if you're going out west, um, play. Three, three different teams out west. Make it worth your while to go that far instead of just playing L.A. and San Francisco. Play all three teams. Yeah. And, and they had a, they had a series this year where they went to Milwaukee for three days and came back. Why don't you go to Milwaukee, play Chicago, or play St. Louis? You're out there. The, the schedule is there. Yes. It's funny talking about West Coast games being, you know, when I was little, Orioles would play the Angels or the A's. And then in the Baltimore Sun the next morning, it would show maybe three innings of the score. Game ended too late before the right. Yeah, you know, it's like I couldn't <laughs> yeah, go to bed for school. Right. Right. Now, that's just cool. Very frustrating as a baseball fan, not to know how your team did the night before. <laughs> since, since I'm from South Carolina, and I can't talk like these guys talk, this one of the reasons I'm a country boy. And I came to Philadelphia with my uncle. Uh -huh. And my first treat, I had a real treat. I saw the Dodgers feed the Philly. Sandy Koufax. I guess so I might have Koufax beat him one nothing. 
The game probably went two hours and two minutes. It was so. great. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, great. So, so. It beat it one nothing. That, that, would, that would be one of my things is those of you who do go to writing or to any other minor league ballpark, they enforce the pitch clock. Yes. Yeah. And it makes the game go. I think we all agree with that. And if baseball finally gets the players and the owners to agree on this <coughs> pitch clock and enforce it, you'll see a much quicker game. We'll take a little break and have a trivia question and we can come back, back to that. I'm going to start off with a relatively easy one. Okay, this isn't for a prize. This is for a prize. Okay. I'll, give you a, I'll give you a hint. Uh, the answer has a local flavor to it. Okay. Answer. okay. And, uh, okay, the question is, the Hall of Fame pitcher who in the 1950s averaged 301 innings, completing 237 of them of of uh, 370 starts in the 1950s. Okay. Robert Roberts. Roberts. You got Robert it. Robert 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 Roberts. Roberts. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll go one more, and then the next time we come back, we'll do a prize thing. Uh, the pitcher who holds the National League and the American League records for appearances in a season. Mike Marshall's one of them. Mike Marshall. That's it. Mike Marshall. Mike Marshall. Mike Marshall. 106 appearances with the 1974 Dodgers. That's my baseball yeah. cards. That's, my, that's how I remember these things. Seriously. Yeah. Yes. And 90 uh, appearances with the 1979 Twins. So Mike Marshall. How many years did he last? That was interesting. Who? Mike Marshall. Marshall? Yeah, before his arm fell off. Oh. <laughs> he was around for a long time. And the interesting thing about it, about it while he was playing, he was he went to the to Michigan State University and got a PhD in kinesiology, which was about how the, the body works, the physiology of how Yeah, he was he more than two days in a row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go, go, Joe. He was at 106 games in 74, right? Yes. 106, 106 games in 74, 90, and, and 19. Uh, uh, 79. These guys are such wimps nowadays. <laughs> by, by the way, Schwarber um, hit one into the trees in center field to open the bottom of the first. Right. Well, I'd love to hear that. Wow. I was there. I was at the game Sunday night, the ESPN game. Boy, it was a treat to see the long pitch game that Hoskins hit the 72 mile an hour curveball for a home run. They were off. Who else has uh, something they would change if they were commissioner for a game? If you don't have anything, I I've got a few more ideas. Yes. I would get I would get rid of the DH. I mean I know okay. we've had I know we've had it for so long in the American League. And I'm still stymied by when that passed. I was a teenager and I thought, what are they doing? Why are the where why is the pitcher not batting? And Charlie Finley even at that time wanted to add more excitement and in essence shorten the games, I guess, in a certain way. There was a lot of strategy out of it. Yeah, yeah. Did, did he want like an orange colored baseball one time? They actually, yeah. they actually yeah. experimented with that. I think in spring training. Right. It was like an orangeish yellow uh, baseball. That's weird. Yeah. Probably loaded night. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple. I'll, I'll have a couple that I'll love to shift. Oh, yeah, that's shift, another. and that'll be that's happy next year. Yes. That they'll have to have. They two. can shift, but they they can't get on the outfield grass, right? Can't cross the I mean, they can't go to the outfield grass, right? Right, and they have to have two infielders on each side of second base. Oh, okay. Second base. Yeah. That's where a lot of hits comes. Yeah. Okay. Right. It was interesting. Yeah, where, where I was sitting, you could you could really see. These guys to hit where it is. Mm -hmm. You would think they're mm -hmm. trained. I mean, they're professional yeah. hitters. You would think they'd be able to do that. At a level of Tampa Bay Stadium, so the ball's under the catwalk every now and then. Right. Right. It's like you're, when you're little with the ball, hit you know the trees or something while you're playing you know, with your friends. That's so, yeah. one of my pet peeves. And the Phillies are one of the teams that have never done it. Is to have your team's name, your full city's name, on your road uniform. The Phillies have never done it. Even though Philly, Philly stands for Philadelphia. Philadelphia Phillies have never had Philadelphia across the front of their uniform. So I would require all major league teams to have, road, and most of them do. Most of them do out of the 30. Um, I would have haircut and facial regulations as used by the New York Yankees. Um, I mentioned about all teams. All teams playing on Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day. Both Pennsylvania teams were off yesterday. Yeah. Which made, made no sense. Um, the Yankees were off. The Mets were out of town. So there was no game for the city of New York to see in person. 
and the LA Angels were off yesterday, but the Dodgers were home, so at least that area had a game to go to if they if they wanted to. Um, Lemony walk off music. Being a guy who used to keep score and who's big in the statistics, I would toss out the three inning save. Some of these guys get a three inning save if they come into the game when it's twelve to nothing. Why would you get a save when it's when it's twelve to nothing? It just this bothers me. Um, what about putting a position when the game's like a blowout, putting a position uh, player on the mound to pitch? I don't care for it, but if they're trying to save their arms. Um, I don't know what you folks think about. I want. I would make sure the manager wears the complete uniform. Mm -hmm. I hate it when those guys come out in the slippers. Sure. Sure. They wear the uniform of the team. You know, yeah. Don't don't look different. The, the coaches have to wear the uniform of the team. Why doesn't the manager? Right. Uh, single admission double headers. Mm -hmm. No more of this uh, split. These split admissions. One thing I'll get into later: change the Hall of Fame batting uh, balloting uh, methodology. So I'll bring that up a little bit later. No more analytic league play. Um, use con common sense to construct the schedules. And coaches are in the box when the pitch is thrown. We were at a Reading game last year or two years ago when the Red Sox third base coach, this is no lie, was within, I'd say, 25 feet of the batter. That's just for, for his own protection. You hit a foul ball, he's dead. <laughs> no, seriously. So he was that far down the line? He was that far down the line, and, and our seats were like two rows from the field. They kept on yelling to the umpire, take a look at where the third base coach is. We looked he's, up at the rule on that. Don't he's we? right there. I mean, he is right there. The coach's box is way over here. The only, and the only, we looked, the rule was only if the other manager protests. Yeah, yeah the only if the other manager does anything about it. Which is, mm -hmm. the other manager doesn't say anything, the umpire is just ridiculous. If I was, oh, if that's the way to if I was commissioned, what I would do? Oh, for Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. Okay, well, that, that, was our, that was our next thing. Players, players who have been shot out of the Hall of Fame or who should never have been inducted. So mm -hmm. let it go because I've so got let's my take a, Let's take a, just a little survey here. How many of us here believe that Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame? Based on, now based, on the the based on all, and that's based another thing I would eliminate is all the gambling advertisements and driving nuts when you're watching the game. It's becoming gambling. Another vote. Yeah. How many think Bobby Bonds should be on? Bobby Bonds? Yeah. Barry Bonds or Bobby? I mean, Barry. Barry. No, Barry. Barry. Son. If, if you Barry voted, Bonds. If you voted on his career before the Yankees, I would put him in. I mean, before the Giants. Right. Before the Giants, I would put exactly. him in. Exactly. Exactly. But when, now, honestly speaking, uh, I don't understand it because when you have something to enhance your ability, or going to your natural ability, and you get an advantage over other players, which a lot of them are doing, you're cheating. Bottom line. That's the way I believe. If you, you know, if you destroy the character of the game, exactly. these guys are cheating. Exactly. Here's the rules, right? Exactly. And, uh, yeah, or sad part of it all. He didn't have Barry in or, or Roger Clemens and or Pete hey, Rose. You can blame the commissioner of the time. Uh, because he knew darn well what was going on. But what's the difference between Barry Bonds and Pete Rose? Put people in the seats. They both cheated. He gambled. Rose was gambling. Not Rose gambled. Gambled. He just gambled. He was the manager. He gambled. So he's got insert eye information right there. Does anyone think that Pete Rose bet that he was team was ever going to lose? No way. Well, he said he bet on his team. He bet on other Yeah, two. Oh, well. Okay. I mean, if you're going to throw a game, that's one thing. There's no way that guy would play the league, so I'm sorry. No. No way. He, like I say, deserved that. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned guys in and out of the Hall of, in and out of, of Hall of Fame, because I, when I was thinking of what little goody for my collection to bring down, I started looking at the, all the Hall of Fame autographs that I've got. Uh -huh. And I've got 10, nine players and a manager. And I started picking them out of the closet, and then I saw, I don't want to bring 10 different items here. <laughs> And uh, one of them I have is an autographed baseball from Gaylord Perry. Wow. The guy doing all the stuff for him. You know, <laughs> you know, his reputation for lubricating yeah, baseball yeah, is, yeah. is famous. Uh, well, what did, what did yeah. we learn from Ben Davis about Greg Maddox when we, we had a, a hot stover thing a few right. months ago and Ben Davis was one of our guests. And he told us something about Greg Maddox that I never would have known or heard. <coughs> I don't remember that. What did he say? He assumed Greg Max would go up to his face with his glove oh. 
He had Vaseline in his mouth. Can you imagine oh. how nasty that tastes? Yeah. He had Vaseline, like players would have uh, chewing tobacco or, or, or the yeah. other stuff, snuff in here. He would have Vaseline between his lips and his, uh, lips and his mouth. That's gross. That is. And that's when, when he would go up, and they never caught it on camera. Oh. But that, that Davis told us that. I was amazed. Hall of Fame, Dick Allen. Yeah. I have Dick Allen. I, I, I have three guys who would be out. Mickey Vernon's another one. I would uh, I would take out Gerald Paines. He only got in because his owner was on the committee. Chuck's not gonna like this one, but I I don't think Phil Rizzuto should be in. Oh, the scooter. Mazeroski should be in, and Steve Garvey should be in. There's no justice. And yeah, you're serious about Garvey too. Right? Very serious. Steve Garvey should be. Any of you have any other likes or dislikes for the Hall of Fame? Is Dustin Baker in? No. no. Dusty might eventually get it. He will get his manager, I think, because he's won over 2,000 games now. Does he? It is amazing what he does series. with his teams. It is amazing what he does with those teams. Yeah. Anybody else? Thumbs up or thumbs down? I think Keith Hernandez should get in, but he won't because of the cocaine thing. Dave 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 Parker should be in for the same reason, and he won't get in for the same reason. Those guys were great. They dominated the 70s. I think Chuck, I mean, uh, I think uh, Lou has some trivia. Yeah, just the, uh, uh, not trivia to me, but uh, this is Reggie Jackson. Uh, I had the good fortune of being able to play with Reggie in 1962 in American Legion Ball in Philadelphia. So I'll pass this around. This is a picture of his Hall of Fame plaque. Can you see it? And this is a, a book uh, about Reggie. And uh, I always described him, he was 16 years old at the time I was 17. And uh, I always described him as a man among boys. Yeah, he played center field for us, and he was our fourth pitcher on the team. And he could just murder a ball. Just he was just awesome. He really was. Uh, all right, another question. Now this one's for a prize, so this is going to be a little hard. <laughs> the player with the most World Series rings, six, six rings, without any from the New York Yankees. <laughs> Wow. 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 I'll say this is from an earlier era of baseball. It was okay. Jay Six World Series. And whoever gets this can have a pick of any one of these uh, three books. Six World Series. You have ten seconds. Did it mean not one with the Yankees? None, None with the Yankees. Jimmy uh, Fox. Nope. Why don't you get one more hint, Lucas? Um, I don't know what to hint to give. Um, well, I'm giving American National League? League. With, uh, League. Uh, League. League. with the American League, I believe. What era? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, uh, I'll, I'll just say it was before 1940. Wow. Before the war. Before my time. <laughs> That's Detroit Tigers. <laughs> right, uh, I don't think he played for the Detroit Tigers. Yes, Hank Greensburg. No, no. Tiger. 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 All right, I'll go into another question for the prize, but the answer is Eddie Collins. Hey, oh, yeah. A's, A's, and White Sox. Was it A's and White Sox? A's and White Sox. Yeah. Yeah. I would never know. Um, the slugger who hit the most home runs in his final season. In other words, the most home runs in his career. His final season? Darrell Evans. Darrell Evans. Evans. Darrell Evans. Darryl Evans. Darryl Evans. Evans. You mean the most of his career, and it happened to be his last the, season? The most home runs in any year was in his final oh, season. He is a Hall of Famer? Mm. Um, yes. Hmm. He was an American leaguer. And you stop us. I can't. Hmm. David, David Ortiz. David Ortiz. He's 38 home runs. Yeah, he's one and all. Uh, oh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's not. He's not <laughs> he's like a home with these guys. <laughs> is he in the hall? He's not in the hall. He's not yet. He's not officially. He's this summer. He's this summer. This summer. He's not officially. Exactly. He's got to wait two more weeks. 
No more Red Sox. What they call it? They call it. What? And and then they he can no no big pop. Yeah, well, he got voted in, but he's not official. Well, he's so, uh, he's got to wait two well, more weeks. We, uh, the people who brought their memorabilia, why don't, you, uh, why don't we do our show and tell about our memorabilia? Because we have like 18 minutes left, and that's one of the reasons so why. We can go a little later. Yeah, the show and tell. Well, like I said, I was a big, uh, still am a big Brooks Robinson fan, so I was assigned back by Brooks. Uh, Brooks Robinson Hall of Fame in 1983 and All Century team. So. Seen him in person, seen him in restaurants in Baltimore. Just a, just a gentleman, you know, on and off the field. And uh, I just remember the 1970 World Series against the Reds. The, the, the My teacher players, brought yeah. in a big, you know, big TV. It was day games, World uh, Series day games. And that 1970 World Series, and he just. John Fisher like the part of him. He took all pictures. And he didn't look like that athletic, you know. I mean, he just, but he, his uh, quick reflexes. And he signed everything. He did everything off the field, left handed. Yes, his dad taught him early to do everything off the left, off the field, left-handed to develop his coordination. Oh, really? So therefore, he signed. And and, and his, the, we were talking about this earlier. The the paint, the painting that uh, Norm Rock, Rockwell did of Brooks Robinson signing an autograph for a young 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 fan. He signed left-handed. Huh, that's interesting. All right, here's another. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, we're, we're just going to go around and put the. Uh, okay, well, this, is, this is a My ticket song. stub. From the 1929 World Series between the A's, Philadelphia A's, and the Chicago Cubs. Oh, wow. This was, uh, unfortunately, it came to me from my wife's grandfather, who knew I was a big baseball fan. It's defaced on the back because he had it glued in it. <laughs> However, that's not around, it's in plastic. What's interesting is from game five, it was a five game series, the A's won four games to one. Um, and the thing that, well, um, and I, Julian, I thought you were going to bring it up about the length of the game. Yes. The five games, ready for this? Game one took two hours and three minutes. Game two, which was a nine to three game, took two hours and 29 minutes. Oh, that's long. Game three took two hours and nine minutes. That was a three to one game. Game four, which was a 10 to eight game, that the A's won by having a 10 run inning. So wow. two hours and 12 minutes. Wow. That included a 10-run inning. And the last game where the A's were losing 2 nothing, and scored three runs in the bottom of the ninth to win the World Series took an hour and 42 minutes. Wow. Wow. Okay. So you didn't have TV commercials. No TV commercials. Uh, one guy playing an organ in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. No fan duel. And um, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the announcer <laughs> might have had a megaphone for all. Yeah. But I, when, when, I, when I looked up how long the games were, it blew my mind. An hour and 42 yeah, minutes. That's amazing. Do you realize with, an all, with a, a World Series game on today, how many minutes they would take between every half inning yeah. for just the TV time? It's one of the games this past week that uh, was. Well, Four hours long. Yeah, it was a first game that was close to four hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah one game. Yeah. My piece of memorabilia is courtesy of my mother's smoking habit. Uh, <laughs> it's the only thing that ever, ever good that came out of her smoking. We lived on Long Island when they were um, when Yankee Stadium was going to get renovated. And Corvettes, if you ever remember, if any of you remember Corvettes drugstore? If you if you bought a pack of uh, not a pack of a carton of cigarettes and ten bucks you got a chair so mom mom, mom forked up forty bucks got a chair for each of us I'm only one of the three four kids who has theirs the others I, and what the other one uh, my brother still has but I don't know what happened to the other two but uh, this is a legitimate, legitimate chair you can come up and see how heavy this thing is and uh, it's an original from uh, the house that was built that's cool I have one yeah, that's, uh, those are fun, they're, they're fun to have, and yeah. when I was at Fleer, I, I didn't bring the card with me, but we had uh, a special card made of uh, 10 Hall of Famers who played, obviously, in Yankee Stadium, and we made a card where the seat flipped up with the, with oh, the wow. stats, and the, on, on the other side of the flip was the player's picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Hope you get this one. <laughs> I thought they're good here. What, broad, what broadcaster said Bob Gibson pitches as though he, <clears throat> he was double parked? 
<laughs> Bob, Gibson, Bob Gibson pitches like he was double part. Eric Kim. So which broadcaster said that? Tim McCarthy. Uh, broadcaster? What about? Dizzy King. Mm -hmm. Not McCarver, huh? Nope. Uh, Jack Buck? Yeah, you know, yeah. The original Jack Buck? That's, that's nope. what I was thinking. Of. Nope. Gary's the old one? No. no. That that very, very, very well known. <coughs> He's still broadcasting. It's not having cows. Bob Costas. Is Kirk Addings? He's still broadcasting. Kirk Addings? No, he's not still broadcasting. Is he alive? He's, he's alive. alive. Oh, I was still alive. Vince Scully. That's it. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 We're right out of names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Jack, you can take your pick of whatever book you want to I have another oh, piece of uh, memorabilia I dug out of my. Uh, I used to keep score a lot. And to so those of you who were here very early before we started, there was an in uh, article in the Inquirer today about pencil them in, and it's about the art of scoring. And they, they, this uh, this young lady they feature here, who's mentioned in the article, her great grandfather was a pitcher for the Phillies for one year, Frank McCormick. So it talks about the lost art of scoring uh, scoring games. But um, when we lived in Hawaii, we went to see a lot of baseball games. Um, when teams came to play in Hawaii, it was the AAA club at that time for San Diego. The first couple of years we were there, they were the AAA club for the Angels, and Chuck Tanner was the manager, which was, uh, which was cool. But knowing that uh, we have a connection here in Phoenixville because of Andre Thornton, this game I, I looked through, it was May, May 5th, 1972, Eugene Emeralds were the Phillies AAA club at that time. They had Bill Robinson was playing that on the team, Oscar Gamble, if you remember, he had the big afro. Yep. John Vukovic was batting third back in those days. Mike Schmidt, well, uh, Bob Boone was sixth. Mike Schmidt batted eighth on that team, not third or fourth. Mm -hmm. And he was playing so poorly in that game that Andre Thornton pinch hit for him. So I wonder if Schmidt even remembers that he was pinch hit for him in the minor league. So, and I have a couple other games, but that's one of my prized goodies is keeping score. I saw most of those guys play at Reading the year before. Yes. Yep. Yep. Because I remember seeing Thornton and Schmidt and Boone. Good piece of trivia. Which is Mickey Mantle's natural side? He's natural. Associated, which is his natural side? He's associated with which side is his natural side? I think it's the right side. side. What did you say? The right side. Right hand. I say left. I thought it was right. I thought it was right hand. I thought it was right hand. Who, 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 and who says the right side? Put the hands up. Who says the left side? Put the hands up. Right side. Right side. <laughs> he had more that's, power for the right Yeah, that's his right. That's his natural side. He and how he rolled the back switch, how he learned it was, because uh, Arkansas could make it hit the left handed. They had a big deal switch. That's for a long time. They had a Mickey Mantle switch in the Phillies when they were playing the Phillies. And the, the whole thing about his father making him learn to bat left, left hand yep. over and over and over. Over and over. Hours and hours. Hours and hours. hours. And hours. Every day. Every day. Muscle, muscle memory. Kind of one, of our, one of our topics we wanted to bring up was players that you have met in person. And I want to say players you've met in person at the ballpark. At the, at the ballpark. Not, 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 not at an autograph show. <laughs> but I did meet Dimaggio at an autograph show. And he yelled at me because I had to put number five. No, a lot, a lot of, I can't lot, do number five. A lot of us <laughs> would go down to the fence and ask for autographs wow. or wait till they came yeah. out of the locker room. Yeah. Anybody? Rich Ashworth. Okay. I was about 12. Um, Stan Lopata. And I have the, That's the story. The story about I said Stan I was going to follow up with Stan Lopata. <clears throat> uh, when I was playing in the uh, and Delhi, uh, this was 1964, 65. Uh, Stan Lopata, after he retired from the Phillies, he was uh, he was the playing manager for the Jenkintown team. And uh, I played for the North Philly Cardinals. And we played our home games down at Hung Park, you know where that is, down at the Boulevard. And uh, they don't have any outfield fences there. Well, Stan Lopata, as you know, had that crouch mm -hmm. that was similar to, he was a right handed batter, similar to. Uh, Stan Musial had from the left side. When he hit a ball, I'll never forget. I swear the ball went 500 feet. 
And to left center field, it just kept going and going and going. And I've often said that if uh, he was batting in Citizens Bank Park, it would have gone out of the stadium. That's how hard he hit that ball. Now, admittedly, it was only semi-pro ball, but nevertheless, that was a pretty neat shot. But I did meet him uh, in, in person and a couple of others. Uh, I got another question before uh, we... Uh, uh, this one uh, is a very interesting question. There were three teams that had three Hall of Famers in their pitching rotation. Three teams that each had three uh, Hall of Famers in their pitching rotation. So what were the teams and who were the who were the Hall of Famers? One's, one's Atlanta. Who were the players? Mattis, Robin, <coughs> and um, uh, Smoltz. Okay, that's one. That's one. Who are the other two? Huh? Okay, who were the who were the pitchers? Bob Feller, Early Lynn, and uh, I'll see it. Lemon. Bob uh, Lemon. Lemon. Okay. Sure. Okay. And then who's the who's the third? Bring it back. Dodgers. Newcomb, Koufax. Dodgers? Okay. And who were the pitchers? Drysdale, Koufax, 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 uh, I'll tell you who the Phillies lost in the, in the Rule 5 draft when I was uh, at Reading. But uh, Clemente went from the Dodgers to the Pirates in the Rule 5 draft. Uh, that's when a player is left unprotected. Uh, they're not put on what they call the 40-man roster, which is still in effect. And uh, the Dodgers didn't protect Clemente, so the Pirates were smart enough to take him. And well, there wasn't Branch Rickey their GM at that point? Yes, yeah. right. So we got, the, we got revenge on the team. <laughs> It's a little cliche about that. They say, it's not, it's not your they knew they had Clemente, like you were just saying. They said, if you want Bully to shoot somebody, who would you shoot? If you, I said, I would put you. Everybody would shoot. He would shoot. Uh, everybody would go. So I would let uh, uh, Crucial go and shoot Frank Richard for getting rid of Clemente. <laughs> <laughs> And when he was with the Dodgers, he was called, he was called Bob. Not Roberto. Uh, uniform thing? Like yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And show us. Uh, Give me the whip. Your whistle yeah. for another whole program. Huh? Could you help me? I need a Dodger. <coughs> well, <laughs> well, Chuck is getting that. Here's another uh, uh, question. The year. Much. What is the year when three like center this. fielders were the league's leaders in batting average, no, home right. runs, and RBIs? <laughs> So, carrying out in the year, there were three different players. They're all center fielders. Two, two of these. Who uh, led the league in batting average, oh, yeah. home runs, I think I had and RBIs. Zipper broke. Two of these, Mickey Mantle. And if you know the players, that, that's like the bonus. <laughs> no? Fifty-five. Fifty-five is correct. And who were the players? The center fielders. Um, Ashburn won the batting average. The uh, home runs were uh, Mantle. I think. Mays. 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 Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Okay. And Mantle might have been the RBI. And the uh, RBI. You know. Okay. You, 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 you want to be the model? Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Happy to be the model. He's modeling me. Whenever you're ready. So, try to the two of you can model these. This is my Dodger fan. I need a model for him. He's going to walk around and show you what we've got. So, I collect jerseys. I've been collecting since high school. And how many do you have, Chuck? I don't want to tell on camera. Well, Plus or minus two thousand. So, oh, wow. um, and he's serious. So, and he has a hat show in Ness. So. This is what I'm going to show you tonight. So Mitchell and Ness is a company that started in Philadelphia. They're still around. Not everything's made locally anymore, but they're pretty good about making true uh, jerseys. You know, reproductions of exactly what was worn on the field back in the day. So since I thought this was a 
you know, an interesting kind of thing. And show and tell. Probably a show we could pro probably, we did once at the Health Foundation years ago. We did mm -hmm. a fun show. So I just said, what would be interesting that maybe some people haven't seen or don't know? So I thought about the period of the 40s and the 50s. And I decided to go, let me pick Dodgers jerseys. Okay. And uh, lucky you're here. So the first thing I have is this jersey is from 1945. Wow. All right, model. You can walk around with that. And it can be touched. I don't care. Yeah, uh, you'll see it's a, it's a Brooklyn Dodgers wool jersey. You can feel how heavy it is. Wool. Now, it's, wearing wool now they're big because they fit me. So, but, you know, they, that is a Babe Herman jersey. It's not Duke Snyder, actually. That's what I was thinking. And that year, they had that patch on there because the war was still going on. And they called that a health patch. Health patch that was the name of it. So you can feel how heavy that thing is. And I'm sure it it's hot. It's wool breeze, technically, but breeze. Breeze, but it's still heavy. Thank you, sir. St. Louis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, John, yeah. weren't they just sold Mitchell and Ness? The Reebok bought them out. No, it was the guy ago. who uh, the guy who owns the. Capolino used to be the owner. I used to well, know him. The guy who owned the 76ers and left the 76ers. Oh, did he? Now they bought them. They bought them. Okay. Well, they, they Peter Capolino bought, founded them, and I used to know him. I used to, well, obviously, I'm a regular. I used to. Be. <laughs> <laughs> they so need to do one for Additional one for the Phillies of Richie Allen. All right, this is a home jersey. Jackie Robinson, what year? 55. 55. Wow. I'll let you walk around that. It's also beautiful. So it's just Robinson. such a beautiful shirt. Yeah, that is. Cream, cream, cream color. And before you put names on the back of the uniform. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. When did they start doing that? 1960, Bill Beck. That this is the home jersey. This is the way. This is the home jersey. Yeah. Yep. Back in the. Uh, Kind of hit back in like the so late 60s. Is it old too? Yeah. 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 Okay. But these two are my favorites. I didn't, and I didn't go any further than this. I could have brought you seven. So way back in the day when lights were first coming onto fields, I think it was the third. 39. But even in the 40s, the lights weren't that bright and things. So someone came up with a good idea. I don't know who it is. But I know the Dodgers did it. I know the Braves did it. I don't know if anyone else did it. But they came up with these satin jerseys. Wow. So the satin jerseys are shiny. And um, you know they kind of shine in the light, and they were a little bit easier for you to see the players. So there's a Duke Snyder. That's cool. So, and, they, um, so the Dodgers didn't put a number on now, the front. Now I'm going to tell you that no, they did not. And that thing is like wearing a plastic bag. It does not breathe <laughs> at all. Yeah, yeah. I actually, and then this is the white. I'll show you. It's the same jersey and white. It's the same ball and this. Same material, white satin. Jackie Robinsons. Um, I actually had this on. I was going to wear it over, and then it started to rain. And it got wet. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, you can feel again. And this one has a zipper front. A zipper front. front. Yeah. But uh, this was pretty innovative, I think, in a way. You know, back then to think of this as yeah. some way to help with the lighting. So that's all I have. I just thought it'd be interesting. I want to be your insurance agent. Just to ensure all your jerseys. <laughs> you know somebody who sells insurance. Too. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, I got another trivia uh, here. Who was the first Major League Baseball team uh, mascot? The name of the mascot. Chicken. Chicken. No. Holy cow. Holy cow. This is for a book. In what year was the National League, National League, founded? I'll give you the three choices. I'll, I'll. Uh, 1926, 1976, or 1876. Down the answer C. Thank you. Thank you. 1876. 1876. Okay, take your pick. Every teacher knows that. Put down the answer C, right, Jack? Now, I want to bring up to you, I know we're wrapping up, but for the Phillies, to do well this year, the rest of the year, right now they're 42 and 38. 
Their home record is 22 and 20. Their road record is 20 and 18. But at the end of the year, they play out of their last 33 games, only 12 are at home. Out of the last 21 games, 15 are on the road. And they play their last name, nine on the road. Ooh. So they, they're going to have to handy up and play well. They have six games remaining against the Mets total. Braves, they still have 12. Against the Nationals, they have 10. And the Marlins, they have 12. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how their pitching holds up because they're down two starters. And the Inquirer did another thing today. Trades worth trying. So they've, they've got some suggested uh, trades that they would make. Uh, of course, Nebraska's not going to listen to them. Uh, but just as long as they don't give up uh, a pitcher that you saw Sunday, right? Who's the pitcher you saw Sunday? Me? At Wilmington. Uh, what's his name? He Man's looks good. Peter. Yeah, he looked good. Big yeah. kid, six foot five, yeah, one ninety, has all the pitches. And, uh, don't you know? They, He's in single A. He's in high A right now. Yeah, high A. High a. Okay, let's, uh, looks like the time's up, so uh, I'd like to end it out with a baseball joke. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. Lose jokes. There, was, uh, there were these two guys uh, named Dominic and Michael, the two tiny guys, and uh, they grew up together, they played baseball together, they went to games together, and they made a pack as they got older. Whichever one died first was going to come back to the other in a dream and let them know if there was baseball in heaven. So. They're, they live to in their 80s, and finally uh, Dominic dies first. And a month goes by, Michael doesn't hear anything from him. Two months go by, three months go by. Finally, the fourth month, Dominic says to Michael, Michael, wake up. He says, I have good news and bad news for you. He says, the good news is they have baseball in heaven. The bad news is you're pitching on Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.